Good evening. Some of you were at uh, a rally that was held on the last Thursday at the uh, Venezuelan consulate. And Omar Wale Clay, one of our propagandists, had us all start by, we are all Venezuela. So we are all, Venezuela. we are all, Venezuela. we are all, Venezuela. and that's why we're here tonight, because we are all Venezuela. Um, some of the things I wanted to say have already been covered, so that makes it a lot easier. In terms of understanding what's going on, uh, probably to the listening or the viewing audience more than the, the folks who are here, to understand in the particular of what's going on in Venezuela, it's, you have to understand two very simple things, oil and ideology. And though they, they always couch it in some other fairy tales, they, they, they've actually been pretty straight up in terms of coming out around uh, it was either Pompeo or Bolden, one of them was talking about, we can, we can run the, or the oil facilities much more efficiently and more profitably for our benefit, uh, which was straight up what this was about. Um, oil, in terms of the, the, the quality of oil that, Ven the quality and quantity of oil that Venezuela has, which are the largest reserves possibly in the world. And ideology, in the sense of what uh, the letter from um, President Maduro talks about, that they are, they are practicing their form of socialism and that's just anathema to what the United States represents. So they're trying to kill two birds with one stone. And you know, Venezuela is part of their troika of tyranny, Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. So they're, they're, they're and I guess that was like, what was Bush's tri tri uh, triple? It was Iran, North Korea, and they're in Iraq, right, right. So they, they bring up these threes. Um, it's a very consistent pattern, and it, it, it doesn't, I mean, there's no big difference between Democrat or Republican in terms of that. You know, um, W.B. Du Bois made a statement back in 1956. He said, democracy has so far disappeared in the United States that there are only, there's only one large party with two different names, and it doesn't matter who I vote for, because they're going to they're gonna win. So he was very clear, and that was 60 almost 70 years ago. So for those who suffer under the illusion that Barack Obama might have made a difference, um, as was pointed out, the sanctions, he began the sanctions on, on them. So they, they, they have tactical differences, but they unite on the major points in terms of uh, control of other people's resources and um, de destruction of socialism or the prevention of socialism. And I, would, I remember reading a quote uh, supposedly by some general who said, it's not my fault that God placed you on top of my oil in terms of what, his rationale for why they were going to go into another country and, and take it over. So, <laughs> yeah, this is real, real bold, right? <coughs> um, and I think one of the points that we want to make in terms of the work that we do is that we have to understand that what's going on in Venezuela is really a blueprint for what they intend to do around the world, wherever there are resources that they feel are necessary for them to make a profit, so that we don't get lost simply with the particular Venezuela, which we must rally to at this point. We must defend, we must attack the United States, we must identify the source, um, as was pointed out by Margaret. They create a problem, and then when you respond to the problem, they blame you for your response to a problem that they created and fostered and, pr and profit from. But we also see the same thing happening in Zimbabwe. And we, you know, we don't want people to make a, a geographical demarcation between what we look at and what we support. And so we think it's important to understand that what's going on in Venezuela is that they're setting a blueprint for what they've done in Zimbabwe, which they've had a contradiction with. Their sanctions began when Zimbabwe took the land back and returned it to the indigenous people has not ended since then. They said the real question is we want to have democracy. That's their, the, you know, the usual fantasy. And so Zimbabwe last, last July had free and fair elections. I was there as an observer, saw it. They were free and fair. Um, the opposition provoked a, some violence after, two days after the election that the government responded to. And this question's in terms of, you know, what the degree of the response was. But that was after the election. That same week, President Trump signed an amendment to the Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act, which is a euphemism for, for what it is, the sanctions uh, bill, which actually ramped up the 
penalties that had been involved in the first one, which basically said, once democracy has been restored in, in, in uh, Zimbabwe, which will be a, a, a decision by the President of the United States, then we'll stop giving all these monies to NGOs, et cetera, et cetera. And they've, they've included in this new amendment that uh, uh, a, a uh, and I guess it's like a, a part of it that would require compensation or return of the land to the criminals who stole it and had it taken back from them. So they're on, they're on the move. And so we just want people to understand that all these things are connected and that we cannot uh, get caught up in, as I said, the geographical demarcations they make to try and divide us. When we say workers of the world unite, that really means workers of the world. doesn't mean that Africa's outside of that orbit or that Africans have uh, some sort of uh, defect that doesn't put them to be regarded in the, same, in the same breath when we're talking about support for Cuba and Venezuela and Nicaragua. One of the things that we've done in terms of responses, aside from going, you know, being out in the street, is we drafted a letter and sent it to the UN Secretary General, which, you know, for what for what it's worth, basically for propaganda purposes, to point out that what the United States was doing is a violation of the UN Charter. So if you are the United Nations and one of your members is violating the Charter, you have to take some steps to deal with it. And in the in the letter we pointed out, and I have some copies that you know we want people to sign on to join it. Um, points out that not only is the violation of the Charter, but even other organs of the United Nations, the International Court of Justice, made a decision back in 1986 when the U.S. intervened in Nicaragua. And many of you remember, remember that in the, in the Bay in Nicaragua. And the International Court of Justice made a decision finding that the U.S. had violated Nicaragua's rights. It's a decision which the United States just ignored since they, you don't have any way to enforce it, so we'll ignore it. But it was a finding around what are the standards for international law in regards to it. So I just want to read one part of uh, that decision, which said, the principle of non-intervention involves the right of every sovereign state to conduct its affairs without outside interference. The principle forbids all states or groups of states to intervene directly or indirectly in the internal or external affairs of other states. And then in 2005, there was a decision around Uganda where the, co where the court, looking at the Nicaragua decision, said Nicaragua had made it clear that the principle of non-intervention prohibits a state to intervene directly or indirectly with or without armed force in support of the internal opposition within the state. Now, I don't think it can be much clearer than that. So, but that doesn't stop. That the, the, you know, I've not heard anything from Secretary General Guterres or any of the other high, or the, the President of the General Assembly, who is from Ecuador, um, condemning what's going on there. So finally, I would just like to uh, invite everyone to the United States mission on Monday, February 4th. Not to the mission, across the street from the mission. <laughs> we're going to have a, uh, we're calling for a citywide rally in opposition to the U.S. intervention in Venezuela rather than do it at Doug Hamachal Plaza, two blocks away. We want to do it right there on their doorsteps. So we want as many people as possible to come out on Monday, 3 p.m., um, 45th Street and 1st Avenue. Uh, spread the word, let people know. We just want, we want to let them know that we're making a statement of our outrage in terms of what to do, that there's no monolith of, a, of U.S. support for what the United States government does in our name. So I want to thank you. And straight we can. We are all Venezuela. We are all Venezuela. We are all Venezuela. <laughs> Doing it is an extension of what they've been doing nationally and domestically in terms of just being straight up. Um, it's, I think Trump has his ducks in place in terms of the, 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 his foreign spokespeople in the same way they, that they, they, they're straight up around white nationalism, they're straight up around uh, the Monroe Doctrine. And I think, I think it also does reflect a confidence, a confidence of what they've put in place, but an underestimation of the people of, of, of Venezuela. But I think this is, this is more, they've got uh, Brazil, they've got Colombia, they've got a number of locations where they have presidents or heads of government 
who are as reactionary and in the U.S. pocket. So I think that's just a reflection. We don't have to waltz around this anymore because there's no real consolidated opposition. But I think the the confidence is misplaced. You know, and I think it's misplaced. But I, I do think it just reflects their own arrogance around what they can accomplish and that they think that uh, money and military threats can accomplish everything. I think the, the point, I mean, how do, we, how do we focus on the particular and also get to the general in terms of the particular of the attack on Venezuela um, and launched by Trump and his hench men? I don't see any women talking on this one, <laughs> his hench people. Um, but the, the broader question, I think we have to proceed from, you know, we, we did a, a hashtag on um, Stop Trump coup in Venezuela for this demonstration on Monday. But you know, you reach, you reach the advanced and, and, and then you, 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 you take it to, to people. Amilcar uh, Cabral said that um, people don't fight for ideas, abstract ideas. They fight to put on food, clothing, and shelter. And so that's our task, is, is how do we take the ideas and take it to their particulars and show them the connections so that they understand that uh, this will affect their ability to live, this will affect the quality of their life. That's what leadership is supposed to be. And to the, you know, so that's, that's our responsibility, understanding that. So I think we've just got to figure out, I mean, the question was right, how do we, how do, we do that? We've got to figure out creative ways of doing that. And the times demand it. Um, we, we're fighting against, we're, you know, at this stage, we're fighting a propaganda war. It's a propaganda war in terms of people's ideas. Um, more than, although in, in, in Venezuela's point, it's a, it's a physical, but we're fighting a propaganda war in terms of how do we win the minds of our people, both here and, and internationally. We've got to find creative ways to do it, given that they have a monopoly on on propaganda and a monopoly on distractions and you know so it's a ta it's our task you know and if if we, I wish I had the answer <laughs> but I do understand the demand and then we've got to rise to that thank you